We use the phrase optical illusion to describe something that we think we see, but it's not as it appears. So the two lines on the screen behind me are identical in length, but the bottom one appears longer. Sometimes what we think we see does not give us the full truth. So how do we respond? If we cannot understand something, we tend to reject it. If we can't make sense of something, we just want to not deal with it. Well, to his hometown in Nazareth, Jesus appeared so ordinary that when they saw him teach with such wisdom and heal people and cast out demons with such power, and people knew him in his childhood, they just couldn't make sense of it all. So in their mind, it's impossible that this ordinary guy could do such things. So they could not make sense of what they saw, so they rejected Jesus. That is, Jesus, you know, the eternal Lord of wisdom, the eternal Lord of mighty works, who became fully man to be rejected by men. So with that, please turn to Mark chapter 6 in your Bibles. Mark chapter 6, it's page 841 in those black Bibles under your chairs, 841, Mark chapter 6. So we're in the tail end here of chapter, chapter 5. We finished last week, So Jesus wrapped up his ministry in Capernaum. So we've seen over the last several weeks that the Lord Jesus made Capernaum, probably Peter's house, his kind of uh, home base for that time of ministering and teaching in the surrounding communities and healing and such. So most recently, we read about four events that painted a picture of Jesus' authority. First of all, he, he stopped a raging storm by his word. Then he stopped a raging storm of demons inside a man, revealing that he's the ultimate authority, not over not just the physical world, but the spiritual world. Then the Lord Jesus healed this desperate woman, revealing that he was more powerful than disease. And then he resurrected a dead 12-year-old girl, revealing that he is more powerful than death. So in this first century, way before Twitter and Facebook, word traveled quickly. We see in Mark 3, his, his uh, family heard about him and traveled from Nazareth, about 20 minute, 20 miles southwest of Capernaum. They traveled there to say, you're out of your mind. You're not even eating. There's, there's crowds gathered around you. But word traveled quickly, and yet people heard what he had done. And so one might think there's plenty of evidence to make a person believe that Jesus really is who he says he is. But there must be something else then that's required because his hometown folks rejected this Lord of wisdom and mighty works as simply an ordinary man. Would you pray with me as we open God's word together? Father, thank you for your word. It's life to us. God, please uh, use your word empowered by your spirit to do your work. God, please guard my heart that uh, what comes out of my mouth would be uh, simultaneously wise and humble for your glory. Uh, that you would I guess, God, that you'd receive this as an offering of my worship this morning, that you'd use uh, the, the words of this sermon to uh, build us up in Christ towards maturity in him. God, use this preaching to mature our faith, that we would see you as you are, as we, as you are and uh, trust in you as we ought. And so I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we know that Jesus was born in Bethlehem to fulfill the words of the prophet named Micah. And then Jesus and his family left to go to Egypt for their own safety. They were warned, but then they returned from Egypt, as pictured in the prophetic words of Hosea. So then their family settled in a little town called Nazareth. So this little town is a scene of his childhood and his early adulthood. So today's verses we'll read here at the account of Jesus, the Lord of wisdom and mighty works. He's now leaving Capernaum to be rejected by his hometown crowd in Nazareth. So please follow along as I read the first six verses of Mark chapter 6. This is the word of God. He went away from there and came to his hometown, and his disciples followed him. And on the Sabbath he began to teach in the synagogue. And many who heard him were astonished, saying, Where did this man get these things? What is this wisdom given to him? How are such mighty works done by his hands? Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, brother of James and Joseph and Judas and Simon? 
And are not his sisters here with us? And they took offense at him. And Jesus said to them, A prophet is not without honor, except in his hometown and among his relatives and in his own household. And he could do no mighty work there, except that he laid his hands on a few sick people and healed them. And he marveled because of their unbelief. Well, Jesus marveled because of their unbelief, but he wasn't surprised by it. This is all part of God's great plan to redeem his people for his glory. So the reality presented today in, in these verses is that the eternal Lord of wisdom and mighty works became fully man and looked like an ordinary man that he might be rejected by men. Well, when Jesus returned to his hometown of Nazareth, people remember, remembered his ordinary identities as a carpenter, son of Mary, brother of his siblings. He's an older half-brother of his siblings. But then when they recognized his extraordinary activities, they couldn't make sense of it all. So what do they do? What do we do when we can't make sense of it all? Even though here is God the Eternal Son in human flesh, well, he astonished them. He astonished them with wisdom and mighty works. But then his hometown crowd rejected him as nothing more than an ordinary man. So we begin with what Jesus' hometown crowd remembered about his identity. So some of the people in Nazareth would have been there uh, when he uh, first came back and his family settled in Nazareth. They knew him for most of his earthly life. So over 30 years or so, they saw him grow up. He learned to be a tradesman under his father Joseph, his earthly father. So Nazareth, I read, is probably about five or six hundred people. Five or six hundred people. It's about, about two-thirds the size of Brandon. It's about 15 minutes south of us. Two-thirds the size of Brandon. So picture this, first century here, as you're walking the dusty road in this little tiny town. You can hear the chickens, you can hear the sheep, you can hear kind of hustle and bustle of tiny crowds of five or six hundred people in this little tiny town. And you can imagine, of course, that with a town of five or six hundred people, pretty much everybody knows everybody else's business. This is before What's Up Rippin', <laughs> before Twitter. Everybody knew everybody else's business. So surely the whole town had heard years before this that this ordinary young lady named Mary was engaged to be married to an ordinary man named Joseph. And then Joseph found out that Mary was pregnant. Well, he knew it wasn't him. They hadn't consummated their marriage, so Joseph wondered what in the world's going on. Well, the Gospel of Jesus, according to Matthew, tells us that an angel then appeared to Joseph in a dream and told him that he was witnessing the fulfillment of a prophecy from hundreds of years before, that the young lady he was about to marry was indeed a virgin, and she was actually carrying God's promised Savior. How about that dream to blow your mind? So when the, the angel then said to Joseph, Name him Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Surely, Joseph uh, shared this with some. So memories of the exact details may have faded over time for the townspeople, but we can imagine that everyone in Nazareth had, had some idea that this boy named Jesus had a very intriguing beginning. Well, Philippians chapter 2 tells us that God the Eternal Son emptied himself in the sense that he temporarily set aside his power and his authority. So the Lord Jesus did not give up any of his eternal power, or eternal divine attributes when he added full humanity to himself. He just added a full human nature to his fully divine nature. So then here he is, appearing as this ordinary man in this ordinary little town in Israel. Well, it's the gospel of Jesus, according to Luke, tells us that Jesus increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man. So he grew as a young man. So then many people probably remember teenage Jesus. You know, the little guy. The little guy who brings the chairs or the, or the tables or the lampstands that he and his father made. You know, he's learning his father Joseph's trade. So they remember the, the teenage delivery boy coming to their place to drop off a chair or a table. Or maybe work on their house. Well, early in his public ministry, after enduring, about, uh, after enduring 40 days of fasting and temptation in the wilderness, Jesus returned to Nazareth. 
So that's his first trip back home, described in Luke chapter 4. It involves Jesus publicly reading the scroll of the prophet Isaiah from 700 years earlier, 700 plus years earlier. And that particular part of the scroll spoke of God's promised deliverer. He read that, and then he said this. Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. And all spoke well of him and marveled at the gracious words that were coming from his mouth. So, however, Jesus continued to preach that from Isaiah. He's preaching that morning in this little synagogue in Nazareth. He, he called them out for their unbelief as he preached. So instead of responding in humble repentance, it says that all in the synagogue were filled with wrath. And they rose up and drove Jesus out of town so that they could throw him down the cliff. So as they're trying to kill Jesus by throwing him off a cliff, he kind of makes his way through the crowd and escapes his hometown. Well, today's text in Mark chapter 6 is his second time in Nazareth about a year later. Well, over the course of that year, he called 12 disciples, did some healing, did some teaching, traveled around, and he comes back now to Nazareth after staying in Capernaum, like I said, about 20 miles northeast of uh, Nazareth. So here's Jesus. He left a tradesman and he returns a teacher. So Jesus taught in the synagogue. Here he is in Nazareth again. He's got his 12 disciples observing him being rejected by people who knew him his whole life. As many heard him were astonished. But as we see throughout Mark's writing that this astonishment, this amazement, doesn't always develop into genuine belief. They may have been astonished at his teaching, but you can hear the mockery behind these five questions. Can you, can you see what's in their heart as revealed by these questions? Oh, sure. Oh, Jesus does some traveling outside our little town, and now he comes back with a bunch of disciples and thinks he's a big shot. He's a carpenter like a bunch of us. Who does this guy think he is? Well, verse 3 tells us that Jesus' hometown crowd remember him mostly as a carpenter and a son and a brother. Well, this little town of Nazareth, two-thirds the size of Brandon, had no high-flying stockbrokers or chief executives of multinational corporations. Most of the people made their living by learning a trade. So Jesus' father, Joseph, was a carpenter, and so Jesus learned that trade. The word carpenter actually is, uh, uh, it could be translated craftsman. Uh, it's tectone. So uh, Nazareth was not densely forested. And so it could be that as a craftsman, he would have worked with stones and build houses. So ESV translators, uh, they're using the word carpenter, so I'll use that word too. But in any case, the main point of them remembering him as a craftsman was that, hey, this guy does not have formal theological training. This guy's been in a seminary. Who does he think he is? Then what does it say? They took offense at him. They took offense at him. Is not this the carpenter, the son of Mary, and brother of James, and Joseph, and Judas, and Simon? Are not his sisters here with us? They took offense at him. Well, this word translated took offense is where we get the word scandalized from. It was scandalous to think that this carpenter would present himself as a rabbi? They couldn't make sense of what they saw, so they rejected it. Well, this ordinary tradesman was the son of Mary and the brother of his younger half-siblings. In the first century Jewish culture, though, it's disrespectful to refer to a man as the child of his mother. So Jesus' disciples, James and John, are listed in Mark 3 as the son of a man named Zebedee. Peter, uh, Jesus addresses Peter as a, he says, Simon Bar-Jonah, Simon, son of Jonah, his father, Jonah. So calling Jesus the son of Mary was only, be, only the beginning of the verbal grenades that the hometown folks in Nazareth and many others would lob at Jesus. So the hometown crowd remembered Jesus' identity. They couldn't ignore his extraordinary activities. They're astonished at his wisdom and his mighty works. But they couldn't make sense of what they saw. So how did they respond? Well, this astonishment is best understood like the astonishment that you might have if you've had this experience, you call customer service. For anything at all, you call customer service. Imagine this. After a couple of rings, an actual person answers, they're competent and kind, and your issue is resolved quickly. 
That astonishment, it far exceeds your low expectations when you call customer service. That's the kind of astonishment we're talking about here. The hometown folks are going, really? This guy? Yeah, I'm astonished. Who left a tradesman and returned a teacher full of wisdom and mighty works? Who is this guy in our synagogue? Teaching like one of the rabbis, except with authority and wisdom and power. Well, when the hometown folks wondered aloud, where did this man get these things? This is not the happy musings of a satisfied customer service caller. This is an audible reflection of unbelief. Where did this man get these things? They couldn't make sense of what their eyes saw, so they rejected Jesus altogether. It's kind of like our saying, what's with this guy? Who, who does he think he is? Where did this man get these things? I mean, we remember him. He, he has this ordinary identity as a, a carpenter and a son and a brother. And yet we recognize his extraordinary activity marked by wisdom and mighty works. But we can't make sense of it all, so we're going to reject it. As far as we know, it's just not possible. This cannot be. So here's Jesus' childhood in this ordinary town of Nazareth. They refuse to believe that Jesus could be anything other than an ordinary man from this ordinary town, no matter what they saw. So the hometown crowd also asked, what is this wisdom given to him? No, note that they didn't deny that Jesus had this profound, extraordinary, extraordinary wisdom, but they wondered aloud, how can all this wisdom be given to him? Well, most rabbis, teachers, learned other trades. Acts chapter 18 tells us that Paul, the apostle, was a tent maker by trade. So rabbis had trades, but Paul also had formal theological education to become a rabbi and travel and teach in the synagogues. He became then a Pharisee one of the sects of rabbis. So Proverbs chapter 2, though, says that the Lord gives wisdom and from his mouth come knowledge and understanding. So then all those gathered in the synagogue of Nazareth would have known very well that God himself is the source of all wisdom. But, but could it be? Could, could it be that the Lord of all wisdom and these mighty works became fully man? Could it be that, that Jesus is God, the eternal Son, who in complete obedience to God the Eternal Father took on human flesh and entered his creation? The hometown crowd couldn't make sense of what they saw. So they rejected Jesus in unbelief. So you can see how wonderfully hidden Jesus' deity is here. He's not walking around with a halo on. <laughs> it's an ordinary guy. His hands got dirty, his feet got dirty. Colossians chapter 2 says that in him, that is in Jesus, the whole fullness... The whole fullness of deity dwells bodily. So, beloved of God, Jesus of Nazareth really is God the Eternal Son who took on human flesh. And for now, he's in this ordinary little synagogue, in this ordinary little town of Nazareth. And by the way, he really is fully God. And it's almost completely hidden in this ordinary looking man. So they rejected him. They rejected him. So then the hometown crowd's third question, how are such mighty works done by his hands? I mean, we know the work of his hands. Chairs, tables, buildings. We, we know the work of his hands. But these healings? How can, how can we explain such mighty works done by his hands? We can't, so let's just reject it. Others had already accused Jesus of casting out demons by the power of Satan. So Jesus' hometown crowd was astonished at his wisdom, astonished at his mighty works, but they refused to believe that he's God's promised deliverer, as he said a year earlier, as Luke records for us. Well, some may have said, oh, I believe in God. Yeah, I'm culturally Jewish. I, I believe in God. Or, oh, Jesus, oh, I believe he's a good teacher. I believe he's a good teacher. You might hear that today, too. And you know what? Those concessions fall far short of recognizing the full truth that was before them and is before us. So this hometown crowd remembered Jesus' identity as an ordinary carpenter, ordinary son, ordinary brother. But, but they were astonished at his extraordinary activities. 
his wisdom and his mighty works. So they refused to believe that Jesus was anything other than an ordinary man. I would say that the, or, the unbelieving heart works to come up with natural explanations for supernatural things. The unbelieving heart works to come up with natural explanations for supernatural things. Well, Jesus referred to himself as a prophet. A prophet is someone from God, sent from God to do God's work. A prophet represented God and speaks on God's behalf. So God the Eternal Father sent God the Eternal Son to be a prophet, to speak on his behalf by walking among his creation in human flesh. And the people of Nazareth, they're still thinking, well, this guy's one of us. He's a carpenter. He's not a trained theologian. This doesn't make any sense. So they rejected him. Well, the fact that he could do no mighty work in Nazareth is not about a limit to his power, but about a commitment to his purpose. No one can hinder God's power, certainly. The purpose of Jesus' miracles is to reveal and confirm the truth that he is indeed God in human flesh. No one else could do what Jesus did. If people continue to reject God's truth, no amount of miracles could convince them to believe. We see that toward the end of Mark's writing. So it wasn't just the hometown crowd, but it's Jesus' own family that could not make sense of what they saw. So they rejected him in unbelief. Mark chapter 3 tells us that when Jesus' family heard that there was growing crowds, they're gathered, and he can't even eat. There's just so many people around him. They said, he's out of his mind. They want to go rescue him and bring him back home to Nazareth. Even his own family didn't believe him. Brothers and sisters. So the Lord of mighty wisdom, mighty works and wisdom became fully man to be rejected by men. And in doing so, he became the deliverer that God promised through Isaiah. So then the people in Jerusalem, we know years later, called for his crucifixion. They had heard that Jesus healed diseases, cast out demons, brought dead people to life, and more. But they rejected God's truth, even to the point of saying to Jesus on the cross, He saved others! He cannot save himself! No, oh, let him come down now from the cross, and then we'll believe him. But they wouldn't. They didn't. Jesus rose from his grave three days later. But many persisted in unbelief until their own grave. And they're still there. Unbelief blinds a person to any display of God's power. As for uh, uh, an all-out atheist, no matter what an atheist might see, he'll come up with a natural explanation for it because he doesn't uh, believe, he rejects the supernatural at all. So the fact that Jesus could not do mighty work in his hometown among these cultural Jews was not about his power, but about his purpose. Jesus then marveled at their unbelief. He marveled at their unbelief. Most of the time we read about people marveling at Jesus, people being astonished at Jesus. There's two times in Scripture that Jesus marvels at somebody else. One of them is right here. Jesus marvels at the unbelief of the Jews. There's another time in Luke chapter 7 where Jesus marvels at the faith of a non-Jew. That is to say, Jesus marvels at someone who should have faith and doesn't. And then he marvels at someone who you wouldn't have any reason to think they would believe, and they believe. And he marvels at them. So in Nazareth, Capernaum, the region of the Gerasenes, that's where Jesus healed the unhinged guy with the demon, demons, and throughout the region of Galilee, people were astonished. They were amazed. And so on. But they persisted in unbelief. So, what's the nature of unbelief? What, is, what does unbelief look like? I would suggest this. Unbelief can look like anything from passive indifference all the way to active opposition. But in the end, the Bible says that unbelief is always Intentional rebellion against God. You might say, oh, I, I, I'm just not into that God stuff. I'm not intentional rebellion. I'm just not into that God stuff. Well, here's the deal. A, a person whose unbelief is revealed in passive indifference might say something like, ah, you, you go ahead with your religion. I, I'm just not into all that God stuff. I, I'm fine with you doing your Jesus stuff, whatever you want to do, but I'm just not into that. 
Romans chapter 1 says this. It says, what can be known about God is plain to all because God has shown it to all. For his invisible attributes, namely his eternal power and divine nature, have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made. So all are without excuse. So, so a person whose belief is revealed in active opposition might say emphatically, why don't you keep your stupid religion out of my face and out of my schools and out of my government and so on. That person is actively opposed. That's how their unbelief is revealed. So un unbelief can appear as anything from passive indifference to an active opposition, but it's always, Romans 1 says, it's always intentional rebellion against God. So to summarize what we see in Romans chapter 1, God's word makes it clear that he does not believe in atheists. There's no such thing. God doesn't believe in atheists. So no matter what it looks like, unbelief is intentional rebellion against God. So Jesus' hometown crowd, even his own household, saw evidence of his eternal power and his divine nature, but persisted in unbelief. God's word tells us that eventually at least two of Jesus' younger brothers believed in him. So make no mistake, unbelief is deadly. Unbelief is deadly. Eternally. Being astonished at Jesus' wise teaching, being amazed by his mighty works will not get you into heaven. Being impressed with Jesus' legacy that he left through your parents will not pay the penalty that must be paid for your rebellion against God. Nor will it relieve you of the eternal consequence that you and I both deserve for our sin. That's the nature of unbelief. And being impressed at Jesus, being astonished with Jesus, doesn't mean anything. He calls us to believe. So, so that's the nature of unbelief. What about belief? What might genuine belief look like? Well, first of all, if there's even a tiny stirring in your heart right now that is urging you to consider the seriousness of what is at stake and evaluate your own heart, that's a really good sign. That's God's grace to you. But I want to say lovingly, you chose to be in here this morning, I, I want to say lovingly, if that's not on your mind, if all you're thinking about what's for lunch, or I want to find my tool to fix my car this afternoon, or I want to go water skiing, it certainly could be, it could be that I'm just not much of a preacher, but it could also be that your passive indifference is revealing deadly unbelief. So what does genuine belief look like? Well, if you profess faith in Christ, look back at your life. Look, look back and think, the time that I first professed saving faith in Christ, that, that is, you believed that Jesus is God, the eternal Son in human flesh, who, who, who came to live a perfectly righteous life, die a completely sacrificial death that he didn't deserve, and then rise again. The, the moment you trusted him to do that in your place, look back to that point and think, how am I different now? You might have said, well, I've been a church person my whole life, but it's only been a couple years since I really said, yes, I believe. So then look at that point. Are you seeing an increase in love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in your life? Has your attitude about the purpose of money changed? Has your attitude about the purpose of relationships with others changed? Has your desire to pray and, and spend time with God increased over time. Has your attitude toward the Bible changed? If you truly recognize God's word for what it is, you can't help but read it. Because you'll be astounded. And it'll move you to want to know him, that he's revealed himself this way. So if you truly believe the gospel, you'll be truly transformed. If you truly believe the gospel, it's because you believe God's word. If you believe God's word, you can read God's word and say, Lord, trust, I trust your word to do your work and transform me. I know that your word isn't just for my information, it's for my transformation. So as I read, God, form the character of Christ in me for your glory. 
So it's only because of the Bible that we know that the Lord of wisdom and mighty works became fully man to be rejected by men. He had to be. Jesus took on human flesh to come out of the ordinary first century town of Nazareth. But he is entirely out of the ordinary. Jesus' rejection was anticipated by Isaiah and it was essential for our salvation because it led to his crucifixion, which led to the resurrection. And so truly believing this gospel will truly transform us. I love it how I'm seeing God's grace at work in so many of you, transforming your hearts, just growing in you an affection for the things of God. What a delight for me to see that as your pastor. So grateful. I see evidence of transformation. I think about reflecting God's grace, supporting uh, new moms uh, through Bell Medical Clinic. Many of you were at the uh, Daughter's Day breakfast yesterday. Think about God's generosity through Lydia's cupboard, reflected through so many of you. Think about God's kindness to, uh, through many of you and generosity reflected in the police appreciation event over the years. Bike rodeo coming up in a few weeks. There's other things you could do on a Sunday afternoon. But you're fixing the bike of a kid you don't even know. That's demonstrating God's love. That's evidence of life transformation. God's grace is a work among us, beloved of God. And so as I ask, I've asked throughout the week, as I, as I walk through your chairs, that God would stir your heart to see him as he is and consider what a treasure we have in him. So I plead with you. I plead with you. Do not reject. Do not reject this Lord of wisdom and mighty works who became fully man to be rejected by men so that he might die for sin in your place and give you new life in Christ by faith.